This series will examine the question of whether or not Jesus Christ was an actual historical figure. The matter is complicated by strong and diverse preconceived ideas, by limited ambiguous historical data and by the coincidence of two completely different debates. One is about purely secular interpretation of historical evidence and the other is about whether God exists or not. Theories about Jesus can broadly be grouped into three types, triumphal historicity, reductive historicity and myth. This is Raphael's 1520 painting of the Transfiguration to illustrate triumphal historicity. A theory which holds not only that Jesus was a real man who lived on earth, but also that the Gospels are a substantially accurate record of his life and works. Here on the other hand is a 2002 painting by forensic artist Richard Neve of what Jesus may have looked like had he been a man to illustrate reductive historicity. The theory that Jesus was a man, but that he had no supernatural powers. Discriminating between these two theories is really about examining theology, as a substantial difference between them is the supernatural component of Jesus' existence. While this is certainly a worthy area of study, it is not our present purpose in this series. This ancient statue of Egyptian gods Isis and Horus illustrates the myth theory, which holds that originally Jesus was seen as a spiritual entity only and not as a man. He did have a limited biography in the spirit realm and was seen as a personal saviour. This spiritual being was then given a fictitious historical biography, which became the Gospel of Mark. Other Gospels then were then derived from Mark and took the story in various different directions. In short, the myth theory holds that the Gospel account of Jesus is entirely mythical. The actual origin of the myths need not concern us greatly, but as you probably know, the Egyptian god Horus has been advanced as one of the potential prototypes from which Jesus was developed. It is this distinction between a minimal historicity and myth theories that we'll be examining. To do that we need to define minimal historicity because there have been several competing definitions. One thing that is certain to be true is that there was a person called Jesus living in Judea in the first half of the first century AD. In fact there would have been many because it was a common name. But our Jesus has to be more than that. One definition used for minimal historicity is that Jesus was the founder of a religion and was crucified. Another is that he was the founder of a religion, was a preacher, was called Jesus and was crucified. The definition that we will use is that for our Jesus to have existed, he did not need to be called Jesus in his lifetime and he didn't need to have been crucified, but he did need to have founded a religion, to have been the first leader of that religion and for that religion to have continued after his death and for its followers to have come to regard him as a god and worshipped him. Furthermore, that religion must have gone on to become what we now call Christianity, or at least was one of several religions which coalesced to form what we now call Christianity. In short, the minimal historicity theory holds that the gospel account of Jesus are largely mythical, but underlying them was a real Jesus of some sort. The method we will use is to construct a historical timeline, and to place the two theories on it and from them derive what we would expect to find in the historical record under each one. Where those theories predict the same evidence in the historical record, we will disregard it, and we will only focus on those areas where the two theories predict different evidence. But before doing that, there are a couple of methods of argument which dominate this debate and which invite comment. These are argument from authority and a particular kind of straw man argument. Arguments from authority are those like the vast majority of scholars agree, or leading experts in the field all agree, or you would never get a tenured academic post holding those views, and so on. Argument from authority is a weak form of argument and its track record in history is poor. Consensus views are frequently overturned by later generations of scholars or academics, but it's not practical to avoid argument from authority altogether. The alternative to argument from authority is argument from the evidence, and that can be highly complex. The most familiar argument from authority at the moment concerns climate change. The evidence here is highly complex and is dependent on very elaborate computerised climate models that non-professionals have no hope of recreating, and for that reason there's not much option for most of us but to rely on what the experts say to guide us. If however we really want to know, we have to go down to the level of the evidence. In the question of the historicity of Jesus, numerous experts contribute to the field including linguists, ancient historians, theologians, archaeologists and so on and it's clearly impractical to disregard arguments that involve citing their authority. 
but we will specifically reject arguments from authority in those situations where the two competing theories have different predictions about what evidence should be sought. Minimalist historicity is the current mainstream consensus in secular biblical scholarship, whereas mythicism has few adherents and many of those who do promote it have limited scholastic credentials. This means that arguments from authority strongly favour the historicist point of view, and therefore discounting arguments from authority gives a significant boost to the mythicists. In fairness, though, we will also reject one of the mythicists' favourite arguments. That is a version of a straw man argument, and it is to show evidence that argues against a triumphalist Jesus, and imply that it argues against a minimalist Jesus when it does not. So we'll begin by constructing a timeline of facts and dates that both the myth and historic schools can agree on. The dates here are not intended to be exact, but I have divided the last two millennia into three periods. A formative period, during which Christian beliefs were developed into what is substantially their current form, followed by a period of historicist hegemony. We can't be certain about when this period began, but an early marker is Emperor Constantine's Edict of Milan, which decriminalised Christian worship in 313 AD, and the First Council of Nicaea in 325, which was a significant milestone in the process of doctrinal conformity within the Church. Christianity became the established Church of the Roman Empire, and the form of Christianity that took the reins was historicist, and their hegemony was characterised by vigorous and brutal suppression of heresy, such that any writing that contradicted the historicist standpoint of the Church was neglected and lost through decay, or actively suppressed. Furthermore, we might expect that records were falsified, added to, or edited in order to support the Church's historicist position. Information coming down to us in the modern age therefore comes in two forms. Firstly, there are those sources that have passed through the period of hegemony and been tidied up and edited for historicity. And secondly, there are, will be occasional sources that have avoided such censure, either because documents were hidden throughout this period, or any records that may have survived in geographical locations outside the reach of the Christian Church. I'll refer to this second form as side-channel information. The period of hegemony, largely the Middle Ages, was then followed by the modern period during which the Church gradually lost its grip on the interpretation of records and side-channel evidence began coming to light. Both the myth and historic theories make the same predictions about what we would find during the period of hegemony, because whichever theory was true, the historicist theory was the accepted one and the one that guided what evidence was left. This means that the formative period of Christianity is the main focus for seeking evidence to decide between the two theories. Here I have expanded the formative period and divided it into two parts. There is an early eyewitness period. This is the period during which eyewitnesses to a historical Jesus are likely to have been available. The exact dates of Jesus' life are debated, but according to the Gospels he would have been born in 6 BC or 4 AD, and would have died in 30 or 33 AD. Life expectancy in the ancient world wasn't that long, but there would still have been some people around in their 60s and maybe even 70s, and this would put the latest date for a living eyewitness to be towards the end of the first century. The Judeo-Roman War of 66 to 70 AD ended with the sacking of Jerusalem and the destruction of the Jerusalem Temple by the Romans in the year 70. This event was followed by the inhabitants of Jerusalem being scattered across Judea and beyond, and therefore 70 AD is a convenient date to use to divide the eyewitness period from the following period we will call the amnesic period, even though it's possible that some eyewitnesses would have survived longer than this. The amnesic period then is the period beyond living memory of Jesus. Any records that date from this period would have either to have been based on earlier records or oral tradition. I have also placed on this timeline the various received dates of writing of the relevant books of the New Testament. Dates are debated and the ranges in some cases are quite wide, but the consensus of scholars generally puts Mark as the first gospel written, sometime in the early 70s, followed by Matthew, Luke and John, and puts Paul's epistles as the earliest Christian writings we have, dated around the 50s AD. The final thing to add to this timeline is the other religions that existed before and during the first century. There were many such religions around the Roman Empire, such as the Egyptian religion, the Roman polytheistic religion with cults to a variety of gods, Judaism itself and its various cults, as well as many others. These religions that existed in the geographical area of the Roman Empire generally did not survive to the present day because they were stamped out during the period of historicist hegemony. 
but there have been revivals of some of them in the modern era. If we now place the historicist theory on this background and ask first what evidence we would expect in the secular historical record. If Jesus existed as a historical figure and he founded a religion that was anything other than trivial, we would expect to see a record of him in the contemporary historical literature and furthermore, we would expect this record to have been sought out and preserved through the Middle Ages. In non-biblical Christian literature, we'd expect to see a progression from a historical figure to an increasingly mythologised figure as time passes, so that the earliest records we have would detail an earthly life of Jesus, with Jesus displaying maybe wisdom and kindness, and with later additions of a more supernatural nature. We would also expect to see some evidence of a debate in the Church, Significant theological changes in a religion usually involve quite a lot of debate, the traces of which often reach us. Dissent from the historicist position of the church would likely have been removed from the record, but we may still find evidence of the church's side of the debate, with statements denouncing those who claim Jesus was simply a man, or statements that specifically justify belief in the divinity of Jesus while assuming that readers accept that he was a real man.